7.30 a.m. on January 19, 1973, 108 excited bandsmen arrived at Seattle Tacoma International Airport for the first leg of Charter Flight 5295, which would carry them nearly 8,000 miles in eight days. Six weeks of preparation and planning had led up to this moment. The band had been invited to the parade in early December and had raised over $40,000 since that time. Candy and button sales had highlighted the fundraising, and over $17,000 had been donated from throughout the state. Musical preparation had been very thorough, with rehearsals held outside in all kinds of weather, and bus rides to downtown Edmond for practice on wide streets. The big day had finally arrived, and after the initial airport check-in, the bandsmen anxiously awaited their departure call. The mixture of nervousness and anticipation gave a feeling of excitement to the morning. Tension was suddenly broken by the surprise sent off from the Meadowdale High School event. <laughs> Terry Sloan, reporter from Channel 4, interviewed several bandsmen for use on the evening news. Washington State, clouds and all, was left behind, and the students settled down for the four and one half hour cross country flight. Landing at Dulles International Airport gave the bandsmen a new ride on a people mover. These vehicles transport passengers between the planes and the terminal. Varying degrees of tension and excitement were present on Saturday morning parade day as the bandsmen awaited the departure of the buses. Nearly seven hours would pass before they returned to the motel. The first destination was Bowling Air Force Base where all the musical and marching units for the parade assembled. The size of the parade was evident from the number of buses bringing participants. Various methods were used to haul musical instruments and other equipment to the parade, but the Woodway Band certainly had the most unique. A full-fledged Atlas Van Lines truck arranged for by muster transfer of Linwood and provided by Paxton Van Lines of Springfield, Virginia. Thank you. 
about 40 degrees, and the strong winds gave a cutting feeling to the chilly weather. This did not, however, seem to daunt the appetites of the 118 acres, and when Major X. Chrissy Burris handed out the box lunches, no one refused. Lunches also cause other problems. And before the parade, most students found it necessary to make a quick trip to one of the many blue buildings with the brand name Johnny on the Spot. There were many colorful groups in the parade from all the states of the Union. Over a mile of the base runway was occupied by the parade participants waiting to be taken across the Anacostia River for the main event. escort to the mall, where they waited about one hour on the buses before disembarking, lining up, and taking their position in the inaugural parade. As the parade began, thousands of demonstrators were meeting at the base of the Washington Monument for a peaceful protest. Many of these people were later at the end of the parade and were verbally harassing all the participants, including our bandsmen. The parade had hundreds of units, and another Northwest band was the Lewis and Idaho band. This fine group spent four days in Washington and then went on to New York before returning home. The white building in the background is Blair House, where President Truman resided during the remodeling of the White House. However, none were more proud than our own warrior band, and we see them now just after they had passed the presidential reviewing stand. We hear the march they played while passing in review before the president, Harry Alford's Glory of the Gridiron. That night, after a quick dinner from the Kentucky Colonel, the band traveled to College Park, Maryland, for a halftime appearance on the University of Maryland campus at the Seattle Supersonics Baltimore Bullets basketball game. cheerleaders opened the show and helped bring the attention of the crowd upon the entertainment being provided.
Michael Traveler with the Warrior Band was University of Washington Husky Marching Band Majorette Miss Chrissy Burke, and she was a rousing success with her special routine. This is the first time in the history of the National Basketball Association that a band has traveled across the country with a team, and this was greatly appreciated by the 12,000 fans in attendance that night. Early Sunday morning, the bandsmen were up and ready to see the sights of our nation's capital. After a hurried breakfast, they were off to the mall, where most of them started with a visit to the Washington Monument. of the bandsmen put them there before the lines were too long, and soon they were at the top where they saw four magnificent views of the city. Most of the remaining daylight hours were spent visiting the various Smithsonian buildings. The Smithsonian Institution is several separate buildings spread out over a large area down both sides of the Washington Mall. The National Gallery, Air Museum, Museum of History and Industry, and Museum of Natural History are only a few of the buildings visited by the bandsmen that day. And visiting these places, of course, kept everyone running every minute of the day in order to see as much as possible. Performing Arts Center was the first of these. of the United States, the White House. Another of the most beautiful sights in the city is the Jefferson Memorial, under light. Breathtaking is the only way to describe the Lincoln Memorial, one of the most inspiring places in the world. Potomac certainly provides a beautiful setting for the Jefferson Memorial, as many bandsmen saw on Monday as another day of sightseeing got underway. Many 
government buildings were visited, as each of the buses independently attempted to show the students as many of the sites as possible in the short time available. Busy Monday of sightseeing was interrupted in the late afternoon for a rehearsal in the band room at the University of Maryland. Rapidly unloading the truck in typical Washington weather, a sudden downpour, the bandsmen were happy to again have the opportunity to play. After a careful warm-up, the sprite sounds of pep band music reminded the warriors that they were still a band, and the primary purpose of the trip was to make music. A very early breakfast on Tuesday brought the band to the White House for the Congressional VIP tour at 8 a.m. The bleary eyes of the tired travelers could not help but enjoy the sight of the home of our president. And even George, the White House pet squirrel, was on hand to see the band. Finally, the tour began, and almost the entire White House was viewed. The bandsmen emerged from this tour having missed only the West Wing, where the president was evidently holding high-level meetings dealing with the conclusion of the Vietnam War, whose truth was announced only 10 hours after the visit. One last glance at the parade's presidential reviewing stand and back onto the buses for a quick trip to the Capitol building. Greeting the band at the Capitol building were three of Washington's congressional delegations, Senator Henry Jackson and Representative Lloyd Meads and Joel Pritchard. They spent time talking to the band and answering questions at a meeting in the Senate office building. While touring the Capitol grounds, many of the band visited the Supreme Court building which is located just behind the Capitol building. Later, under the dome in the rotunda of the Capitol building, many had the opportunity to view the catafalque, which had been prepared to receive the casket containing the body of President Lyndon Johnson, who had passed away only the day before. Much time was spent by individuals preparing for Disney World by practicing riding the Senate subway, which connects the Senate office buildings with the Capitol building. But the time in Washington had to end, and so the band bid farewell and resumed flight 5295, destination Orlando, Florida. Arriving in sunny Florida, in typical Washington weather, the bandsmen hurried off the plane in search of the terminal. Donning tourist gear and again getting on and off buses, the bandsmen got a break in the weather Wednesday morning as they visited the buildings and features at the Cape Kennedy Space Center, about one and one half hours from Orlando. The massiveness of the launch pad is hard to realize without being there in person, but one can get an idea of its size by viewing the vehicle assembly building where the rockets are assembled, 
which is nearly as tall as the Space Needle in Seattle. The rockets are moved from the building to the pad on the transport tractors, which travel on roadbeds with a width equivalent to a 12-lane freeway. center is located a sample of moon rock and many displays of the various flight supplies and equipment samples are shown both inside and outside the tour center. The Space Museum has samples of nearly all the rockets launched. A half-hour film and 40-minute lecture culminated the day at Cape Kennedy. Although the day had been long and tiring, no trip to Florida would be complete without a trip to an alligator farm. And the bus drivers knew of the best. Herman Brooks, Gator Jungle. The atmosphere speaks for itself. Best prepared for the next morning's parade and concert at Walt Disney World, a rehearsal was held at Osceola High School in Kissimmee on Wednesday night. Although the temperature was high and the humidity was higher, a pleasant evening was had by all. First-class accommodations were provided in Kissimmee at the Quality Motel, the best in the state. The students obviously enjoyed their motel stay, and neatness was certainly important in the minds of all. If you think this is a mess, you should have seen it before they cleaned it up. The time had once again come for a performance, and the band was preparing to leave for Walt Disney World. During a break before the parade, many of the bandsmen were entertained by the health. Some bandsmen entertained visitors. And others were very helpful. Quite a few began spending their money right away. But for all, the big moment was fast approaching. Preparation for the parade and concert made the tension build. The concert music had been announced early in the morning at the motel.
and the benefit of the early preparation was obvious. And suddenly the band was again performing. Directly in front of the Cinderella Castle, the band performed for a large audience after the parade. The cheerleaders and Christy Burroughs were favorites on several numbers. comes that rainy day feeling again.
closed, the day was available to see the sights. And Mike Fink headed for Mike Fink's keelboats, only to find they were not yet open. A ride on the Skyway from Tomorrowland to Fantasyland gave Bandsman the opportunity to look over the entertainment available. magnificent structure of Disney World, located just outside the Magic Kingdom ground. The second best band ever to appear at Walt Disney World entertained throughout the day. And many warrior bandsmen enjoyed the novel fife and drum band in Liberty Square. After returning to the park on Friday, the end of the trip was drawing near. Loading the truck, cleaning the rooms, and in general having a relaxing evening while awaiting departure claimed the time of the band.
days of traveling together brought many new and lasting friendships. Because of all their hard work, Dr. and Mrs. Bellamy took the final moments of the trip to plan the Hawaiian vacation they were taking two weeks later. A long but exciting six-hour flight brought the band back to Seattle Tacoma Airport, where hundreds of friends and relatives were out at 11 p.m. to greet the band. <laughs> Having been up for over 20 hours, the bandsmen were most anxious to return home to a well-deserved weekend of complete rest. all the sights clearly and feel the joy result in our hearts those eight days. But most of all, we will feel the honor bestowed upon us and feel that each and every one of us has done a service for his country. The trip to D.C. in 73 is now a memory. <laughs> 